Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with New York Jets offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham Jr. is brought to you in part by Compassion International. Now, all of us want to help. All of us want to make a difference. All of us want to figure out a way that we can help someone else. Well, Compassion International is the perfect place for that because they work exclusively through the local church in communities all over the world to directly impact and help children in need. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum is the website. It's $38 a month. We're talking about one child at a time. 1.8 million children in 25 countries have been impacted by the work through Compassion International. And you can make that difference. You can sponsor a child. You go to the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, $38 a month, and you sponsor a child, and you bring hope to a child. And the great thing is, this is Christ-centered. 150,000 children chose to follow Jesus in the last year alone because of the work being done by Compassion. It works. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, $38 a month, the best $38 you will spend every single month, and sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast is New York Jets offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham Jr. Kelvin is going into his seventh season in the NFL. He was a seventh round selection out of SMU by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2012. He played four seasons in Pittsburgh from 2012 to 2015. He played one season with the Jaguars in 2016, and last year he came over to the New York Jets, and he's been there now. This will be his second season playing with the Jets, and he joins us here in the podcast to talk about a variety of things, including training camp, which we, of course, call the necessary evil in the NFL. Training camp is underway now. We taped this interview the day before Kelvin was reporting to 2018 training camp. We also talk about his faith in Jesus. He says he grew up in the church. And I'm not just talking about Sunday mornings. He says he's going to church pretty much every day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There was something going on in the church, and he was there throughout his childhood. And then we talk about the the sort of struggle, if you will, and the um, time that he had to acclimate himself into college at SMU and sort of the culture shock that existed in going to college. And then, of course, making his way even in more of a culture shock into the NFL Kelvin also is a guy who is charitable, he wants to give back, and he has a heart for ending hunger and for education. And I love hearing you know, the work that he's doing outside of the realm of football in trying to end hunger and trying to provide education for, for many young African Americans. So really cool podcast here, kind of gets you in the mood for football. I think you guys will like this. Without further ado, let's get right to it. New York Jets offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham Jr. joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Kelvin, welcome to the show. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on. It's good to talk to you. Now we're taping this in late July, literally the day before training camp kicks off for the 2018 season. This is your seventh year in the league. I've had many football players tell me through my years and talking to them, that training camp is that quote-unquote necessary evil. Now, you're one of the veterans now. How do you view training camp? What what do you look at when, when you hear training camp? What comes to mind? Well, uh, you, you you hit the nail on the head. It's a necessary evil. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the excitement of the season is getting ready to start. Uh, the excitement of being around your teammates again, uh, you know, after having the summer off is always exciting. Uh, but it's a necessary evil. You know, you know it's going to be hot. You know you're going to have a fight or two. Uh, you know it's it's uh, it's going to get a little testy. And you know, you know you're going to do some things that you don't want to do. But that's training camp. That's how you get better. That's how you uh, grow as a player. That's how you grow as a team. You become hardened during training camp. So it's uh, it's part of the journey. It's part of the process. What is something that the average NFL fan doesn't realize that you'd like them to know about, maybe about training camp or preseason? What is something that the fans probably don't even realize is going on as regards to training camp? You know, it's so many things, to be honest with you. You know, the food starts to taste the same. You know, many people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you get tired of being around the same people, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, 
the the pranks and the jokes that are done to rookies and young cats on the team is is bar none the 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 best moments of your life or some of the moments you remember for life um and then the experiences it's always something some type of experience that happens during training camp um where you just feel the team either jail or come together or 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 do something that that really shows you that you have something special for that year um and that's something that that many fans don't know about or, or, or never really hear about now you're in your second year with the Jets. Last year you were with your third team in three years. So how nice is it to be back with the club that you played with the year before? <laughs> That's got to be nice, right? It's amazing, man. You know, uh, you know, I was talking about this earlier. With uh, I had another interview earlier today, and was talking about you know how you have trans, you know, been with three different teams, and I'm like, it's for football players, it's easy to go from. I feel it's somewhat easy to go from team to team. It's just a difference in culture. But it's the family that that really struggles with um, jumping from team to team, honestly, because, you know, you have to uproot. If you had an apartment, you got to clean the apartment out, go to another spot, clean that apartment out, go to another spot and, and stay in the same spot where your your kids get to come to the same bed, sleep in the same bed, came to come to the same apartment and see the same apartment. You know, that structure is something that's uh, it's priceless. You know, I, I tell people all the time, I grew up in the same home. Every day uh, of my life growing up, I did not move. I didn't know what it was to move until I went off to college. And since I went off to college, I've been on the move ever since. Well, if you're in the NFL, what is the acronym, right? Not for long. Uh, so you got you got to be ready to go. And, and you've done that now, but you're settled in here with the Jets. We're talking to Kelvin Beecham Jr. here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You mentioned growing up in the same home. Let's go back to the beginning of your journey and maybe start with football. When did football become something that you realized that you were pretty good at? You know, football became something I, I thought I was good at. Uh, and I'm still, still, still debating if I'm good or not. Uh, <laughs> as long as they keep paying you, you gotta, you gotta believe it, right? Keep paying me, exactly. Um, I think it was my, my junior, sophomore and junior year, uh, in, in high school where, um, it kind of struck me that, that I could do this, you know, um, and the reason I say that because I was a basketball player growing up, man. I played ball all the time. My dad built a basketball court for us outside of our house. Um, so we, you know, we didn't get into trouble or didn't go places where we didn't need to be kind of to control the environment a little bit. And, um, you know, I just played ball all my life, man, until my sophomore year and a, a coach came up to me. He was like, Kelvin, there's a lot more scholarships playing football than there are basketball. And at that time I was, a a six two, six three, uh, you know they always fluctuate your 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 your, uh, your height in college, but of course six. <laughs> I mean, not in college, but uh, in high school, but a uh, six three center uh, playing basketball. You know that's a little too short mm-hmm. to play pro ball or play college ball at that. And you, you can know, play a little guard though, right? Play. I mean, I could dribble, but I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I wasn't uh, Chris Paul or or. Uh, uh, Darren Williams or uh, J.J. Reddick. I wasn't one of those types, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was more of a Mark Jackson type. I just back it down the whole, you know, the, the, whole, the whole length of the court. Or Avery Johnson type. Um, but uh, told me, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, more scholarships on the football field than there was on the, uh, on, the, on the basketball court. And took that advice and started to run with it. You know, I've been playing football um, just like I've been playing basketball since I was – uh, a very, very small kid, I think five or six years old, still got pictures from that time. And they've been playing, you know, playing both sports, played dual sports, dual, you know, was was a dual sport athlete, um, did track in in, uh, in high school. But when it got serious it was for football, it was, I said, I said my sophomore, junior year, um, when, you know, I saw that I can get a scholarship playing, playing football. Basketball, you said, was, was for first love. Who were your heroes growing up, sports heroes? Sports heroes, you know, I had, um, for me, it was people like uh, David Robinson, uh, yeah. Tim Duncan, Alonzo Mourning, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, um, uh, uh, Sean Elliott. Um, those were the people for me that were, that were special and sports heroes that, that I saw. Um, A.C. Green, uh, uh, those are the guys that I look towards from a sports hero standpoint that I really – enjoy watching and, and, and grew up watching and really loved loved those those guys growing up. Growing up in the same home, you said pretty much for your entire life. What was life like around the dinner table at the Beecham household as a kid? 
you know, um, my dad worked a lot, worked a ton. Um, it would be times that we didn't see him in the morning and didn't see him at night. You know, he was working all the time. He would come home for dinner sometimes. But for the most part, it was my mother and, and four kids. Uh, my dad would sneak in for dinner and get back to work. Um, we would see him early in the morning. Uh, but dinner time, it was, it was uh, the four of us, me, myself, my sister Crystal, my brother Jacob, and baby sister Michelle and my mother. Um, doing homework at the table. I remember her cooking hamburger helper and corn. Uh, I remember that so vividly. Hamburger helper, corn, and green beans. Like we ate that every night. Uh, <laughs> but I turned out just fine. Right. You know, you did. Now, what about faith in, in terms of growing up in a household? Was faith a part of that? Was Jesus and church a part of that? Man, I was every day, man. Yeah. You know that. You know the thing is, is, is I talk about it because I, I assume that people know. Man, I was. Uh, we were in church near about every every day of the week. I I, I don't kid you. Um, Sunday, uh, we were actually in church twice on Sunday, sometimes three times on Sunday. Um, so Sunday school in the morning, regular church service. Uh, sometimes we have a three o'clock service to get to, and then YPWW again at 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 night. Grew up Pentecostal, so we had church on Tuesday night, church on Thursday night, somebody's musical on Friday night, choir rehearsal on Saturday night, and then uh, <laughs> church on Sunday. Uh, so grew up, uh, in the church all my life. Uh, you know, even when I was down, down this past weekend, I was, um, down at the church for the weekend and, and then, um, grandfather, uh, after, after Sunday morning service was like, Hey, we having church again tonight. <laughs> I was like, I still have church tonight. Uh, and I had to pick up my wife, so I wasn't able to make it, but my grandfather, 91 years old, still pastor. Uh, my my dad is the assistant pastor. My mother's a missionary and uh, Sunday school teacher, YPWW teacher, Bible band teacher, uh, cook the whole nine. So it's a group in a very small church, but um, faith was everything in our family. Honestly, faith, our relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, um, our our uh, sovereign God, and, and knowing who God was 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 very evident. Um, the Holy Spirit, that was the, the Trinity was something we talked about and we knew about at a very, very young age. You say uh, church was everything, you know, in terms of going all the time. But I wonder just obviously your faith is strong now and we know that. Uh, and you and I have met a few times and I know that just seeing you and how you're, you carry yourself. But I wonder just when you're around it all the time, was there a moment at all where you were just like, can we please just not go to church today? You know, and I don't mean that in a negative way, obviously, but just was there a struggle for you at all? Maybe high school, college of a time where uh, you were just kind of like uh, you needed to kind of get away a little bit, I guess. You know, for me, I never really had that, honestly, you know, That's good um, because I played the drums at church. So I was very active in church, you know, <laughs> Okay, I actually look forward to it because I got to work on my craft, you know, um, but it, it was it was something that um, it inhibited uh, other things in life. You know, I never knew what it was to have a sleepover. Mm. Um, we didn't know what it was to go to the movies. Uh, um, going out during the week, you know, even going out to dinner, that, that wasn't a thing. Um, hanging out with friends, it just didn't happen. It would be times, like I said, we had the basketball court at our house. Uh, if we had church, that started at seven o'clock and the, and the boys outside playing, we had to go inside, get ready for church and leave, you know, lead the friends out there playing ball on our court while we, while we go to church, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, we didn't get, a, we didn't have a chance to, to, to experience a lot of other things. Um, and we wasn't really exposed. We we're very sheltered. Um, so leaving and going into college, it was a different exposure it was it was different i didn't have you know my parents that were there uh telling me hey we finna go to church this day and this day and it came yeah. to a point where like that was still ingrained in me and even now you know here in new york now i had a great system in pittsburgh where we went to church uh during the week and went to weekly services uh and, and choir practice during the week but you know since i've gotten here in new york i haven't found that type of you know that type of that type of cadence so even as old as I am, I'm 29 now, I still look for that particular cadence of being in the church, being in corporate worship, being in corporate prayer, 
being in uh, small groups where we're, we're learning about the gospel. We're talking to Calvin Beecham Jr. here, New York Jets offensive lineman on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Was You get to SMU, you mentioned college. Was that a culture shock for you? Was that just like, whoa, okay, this is a different – this is different than the life I grew up with. Oh yeah. yeah. It was, it was night and day, honestly. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into it to be, to be honest with you. Um, just exposed to, to so many different things, so many different ways of life, so many different ways of thinking, um, so many different people, so many different social economic classes that went to SMU. Um, they're in the heart of Dallas. They're in, in, in Highland Park, which, which is one of the richest and, and most affluent areas in the, in the entire nation um, was just not exposed to that type of, that type of lifestyle. And what was, what was it about college that you would do different? And what was it about college that was something like, yeah, this was, this was an amazing experience. Cause you I wonder culture shock can be good and bad in some ways because it acclimated you to something different, but at the same time, it was not what you were used to. Yeah. You know, I mentioned earlier how how I as an individual was, was very sheltered um, uh, growing up. Um, one of the things just wasn't exposed to to to, to women to this extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and went down a path early on in college that that wasn't godly. Uh, I knew it wasn't right, um, and went out went out on my own um, and. Got involved with 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 women that I shouldn't have gotten involved with uh, while I was early on in college, but on the flip side of that, during that point in time, and after I came out of that little phase where I wanted to just go and experiment with everything, right. um, it came to a point where I had to build a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so yes, I knew the Word, I knew the Bible, I could quote scriptures, I knew what it was to go to church. I knew how to be on time for church. I knew what, who God was, what he was, what the word said about obeying his word. Um, but I didn't have that personal relationship. And I think that personal relationship happened because of the exposure that I had in a negative light early on in college. And that helped me be the person that I am today because of that exposure. Well, not, I'm not going to say because of that exposure, but I think the, the, my personal relationship with, with Christ now is because of the things that I went through early on in college where I had to know Jesus Christ and I had to know him for myself and I had to know who the Holy Spirit was and what he was sent down for. Um, I had to learn those things for myself instead of a living on mama's faith, or living on daddy's faith, or living on grandma and grandpa's faith. It was living on the faith that, that God had graciously granted me personally. And then you come out of SMU and you're selected in the seventh round by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2012. I wonder what you remember about that weekend and having to wait until that final round of the draft until you were selected. You know, I, re- I remember very vividly, you know, um, the, the, the first day um, I was actually at my dad's shop um, down in Mejia, Texas. Um, I was doing everything in my power not to even be remotely close to a TV. Um, the Saturday really just spent time with family. Uh, I know that, that second day, whatever the second day is, Friday. Yeah, that Friday um, night, I think. Yeah. yeah, Friday night, spent time with family. Um, and then Saturday, actually went to a family reunion to go, well, a family gathering. Uh, my family couldn't make it, so I went and drove down from, from my head to Jacksonville. I knew I had to get back to Dallas because we, uh, we had our SMU um, athletic, uh, you know, the, the end of the year luncheon sure. um, that Saturday night. And uh, went to Jacksonville to... Um, uh, to go and see family, Jacksonville, Texas, to go and see family. And um, actually went to sleep <laughs> during, during, during the draft and got a couple calls uh, <laughs> while I was there in Jacksonville. And on my way back to Dallas, that's when things started heating up and I started getting more phone calls, whether it's about free agency or, or late in the draft and thinking about you and fighting for you, this and that and the other. And then um, I was actually at home and um, – in my apartment by myself uh, and, and got the call from Pittsburgh and um, uh, talked to a number of people in the, in the administration there and, and uh, left and picked up my, my, my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time and uh, went over to, to the, to the SMU, uh, SMU event and, and 
from there, it was a couple guys that got drafted that same night, well, that same weekend. So Josh Rebus was drafted in the third round. Uh, Richard Crawford was drafted in the sixth round. Taylor Thompson was drafted in the fifth round of that, that particular draft. And Cole Beasley uh, went undrafted that night, but ended up going to the Cowboys. And um, It was a special night for, for a lot of SMU guys. You know, um, SMU is known to put out a, a lot of players, but ended up putting out a, a number of players in that particular draft that year. That's awesome. And when you get to the NFL, I wonder, there's always adjustments that need to be made just in terms of, you know, what it's like on the field, certainly, but even off the field and just, you know, making money and, uh, you know, the life of an NFL player. Uh, so I wonder, and, and everybody wants a piece of the action, or even the rookies, you know, they're trying to just figure it out. But you realize suddenly that there's temptations and money and, you know, tell me about what that was like and maybe how you were tested spiritually when you came into the league, what that was like for you? You know, honestly, when I, when I came into the league, I, 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 I tried to get connected to solid people, solid brothers, solid Christians. Mm. And, and um, in Pittsburgh, there were, there were a number of, of great guys. Now, there were uh, guys like um, Max Starks, uh, who was a believer. There was guys like Ray Jackson, who was our player development guy. Um, and tried to get plugged in because I knew – I knew me. I knew what I went through early on in college, and I didn't want to go down that same route. So for me, went to try to find solid people around me uh, or solid people in the area uh, to start holding me accountable, to, to spend time with them. Um, wasn't married at the time, was, was dating at the time. Um, found a church, got plugged into the church and some of the men at the church uh, just to, to, to put myself around people. So I wouldn't go in that particular direction. Um, and the thing is, temptation is there. It's always there. Whether it's temptation for greed and money and fame, whether it's temptation with 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 females and 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 being out of the covenant uh, uh, of Christ when it when it, you know as it pertains to, to sexual sins. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew me, so it's like I tried to do everything that I could to 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 stay away from uh, that particular that that I start I started to stay away from that part of me knowing that that's flesh and try to stay out of flesh as much as possible. You mentioned in college, you know, those temptations, that's kind of where it hits you when you were just like, hey, let me try my own thing for a little bit. If you were talking to a young man in college right now, maybe he's a, a college athlete. Maybe you've done this with SMU uh, and your alma mater. And you know this guy, he's a follower of Jesus. He, he loves the Lord. And you can give him a piece of advice because just because, like you said, just because you love the Lord and you follow Christ all your life doesn't mean you're not going to fall. In fact, the Bible says we're all sinners, so we're all going to fall. So I wonder for you, if you were talking to a young man in college, an athlete, follower of Jesus, what kind of advice would you give them? What would you say to that guy? You know, that what you know now to that young 20-year-old kid? You know, uh, to be honest with you, I would say I've been down that road. Um, experience is the best teacher um, and would just show them in the word what um, what sin does to your relationship with Christ um, but also talking love knowing that nobody is perfect we're not perfect we have a gracious God we have grace but we also have a jealous God and if you say that um you love God. The Bible talks about uh, being either hot or cold. And if you're lukewarm, he'll spit you out. Mm. You know, just pick one. You know, don't uh, don't be lukewarm. And for me, I was lukewarm early on in college. Um, and I think for me that the, the message that I would really, really just drive home is, is, is understand what the word says. And if you want to be a follower, be a follower. If you don't, don't. And I think God won't have any ill will to you. Um, just pick pick a direction. You know, don't don't try to sit in the middle. Talking to Calvin Beecham here, New York Jets offensive lineman on the Sports Spectrum podcast. A couple more questions with Calvin. I want to pivot for just a second, Calvin. Now, you've been in the league for a while. You said you're 29. Uh, and I, I want to ask you not specifically about the anthem protests, and I don't want to talk about whether guys should or shouldn't or anything like that or penalties or fines. But I want to talk about from a perspective of someone who loves Christ, a, a Christian, there seems to be a divide, not just in the world, but within the body of Christ on many of these type of issues, specifically race and injustice. 
I wonder for you, what are your thoughts on issues like these and how we can be united as a body and not divided in the body of Christ? Well, the thing is, as you said the word, like united, if we're really united and if we really care about the message of Christ, then we'll find a way to work together, you know? Um, and no matter where you sit on the topic, no matter what side of the aisle you sit on politically, if you believe in Christ and you believe in people and you believe in humanity and you believe that the world should literally be a better place and you believe that our, our Savior died for, for all of us to have grace, show grace and show love and find a way to do something together. And I think at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You know, uh, I think we're in a time where issues have been brought to light that have been around for a long time. Uh, that have been swept under the rug for a long time, and now they're being brought to light. You have social media that's really exposed um, a lot of stuff to to the human eye. Now, media in general has taken some things and and sent them certain directions. But at the end of the day, you know, if you love God, find a way to work together with with whoever is in your community, your particular community, um, issues that you care about and that you that you feel led to do something about. Um, but the thing is, I think we got to get out of all this finger pointing and he said, she said, and complaining about this, that, and the other. And if you believe something needs to be changed or you see somebody on the opposite side of the aisle on this particular topic, go over and have a conversation, have a pray about the conversation before you start and then have a conversation and then find a way to do something together. Isn't football the the perfect, uh, sort of microcosm of, of what it can be like in terms of, just how the world can be. You know, you have people from different places, different races, different religions, different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, and yet you come together. Uh, and now you're one of those veterans, you know, somebody like Josh McCown, another veteran on the Jets. Um, and you have young guys and people with different views and people with different experiences, but yet you got to come together for a common goal. That's kind of a, sort of a small picture of kind of how it could work for our country, right? It's, 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 it shows it, you know, on a, on a Sunday to Sunday basis. You have people who come from rich backgrounds, poor backgrounds, African American backgrounds, Caucasian backgrounds, Indian backgrounds, African backgrounds. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, all types of Nigerian backgrounds. You know, Hispanic backgrounds. Uh, you know, all different social economic status. Some people are on food stamps. Some people weren't. Some people was on free and reduced lunch. Some people didn't have to worry about, you know, where, where their next meal came from. Some people wore the same clothes to school every day. Some people had, you know, every pair of Jordans growing up, you know. Um, yeah. Some people had custom clothes growing up. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? But all that stuff is put aside when we when we come together, either during training camp or uh, during preseason or the season. And we put all that stuff aside and we go do something together. We come. We find a way to, to to come become unified throughout the season, and pray that 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 we're unified on on game days so we can all perform together as one and win and win those games. And if we can do it on a football field, I feel that we as a society can be able to do it. And the thing is, is people in the locker room have political views as well. Okay. You know, people in the locker room have views on taxation, um, international affairs, foreign affairs, um, tariffs. Uh, uh, racial injustice, um, racism. Everybody has a view. If we were, the thing is that sometimes I feel people don't feel that we're human when we play football. Like we're human. Like we bleed. We put our socks on, our shoes on, our pants on, just like you know people across the world do every single day. So it's not like we're numb to what's going on around us. It's just we're in a locker room with people who have all types of views, and we got to put all those things aside to go and do something together. You know, and we do that on a weekly basis. Yeah, it's a it's a perfect picture of what the church <laughs> in many ways should be like, you know, and just coming together like that. It's really good. Let's have it. Let's end it with a, a couple more questions here specifically about faith, but also about giving back. You know, the Bible commands us to be charitable and joyful in our giving. I know you are as far as, um, you know, being involved in, in many different causes. Uh, tell us about some of the things that you're involved with and some of the, the, the sort of charities and passions that you have about giving back. So for me, I deal in two verticals, and I tell people this all the time. It's one is ending hunger both domestically and worldwide, and the other is STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. For me, the work that I do on the hunger side is so um, 
not only impactful for the people that I that I do it for, but it's so it's so humbling and impactful for me. Um, you know, I've learned so much about myself and and about society as a whole. You know, doing the work that I've done uh, in the in, in the hunger sector, um, being able to work with food banks in, in every location that I've been at, whether it be Dallas when I worked with um, the North Texas Food Bank while I was in college, the Greater Pittsburgh Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. The Northeast Florida Food Bank when I was in Jacksonville, and now the New York Food Bank in New York, and then the hometown food bank that that I that what well, is called the Central Texas Food Bank, which services my hometown. Um, I've been able to work with five food banks. Um, have been on the the board at Feeding America uh, for a number of years. Uh, a partner with World Vision, uh, and just love the partnerships that I have with 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 those partners and the work that we're able to do in the community. And um, it's not only you know some of the hunger issues that are happening here, but it's also the water crisis um, mm. that's happening not only here in Flint, Michigan, where we don't have access to clean water for the entire community, um, or whether it's in third world countries. So have actually been to um, Honduras um, to, to actually see uh, how lack of clean water and lack of access to clean water can affect the community, um, both positively and neg- uh, negatively. Um, uh, currently looking at uh, a couple other countries to go and, and, and visit uh, to, to, to look at their, their the water crises that are happening there. I know that there is a, I think the last time I heard there was famine in Somalia, Somaliland, because of the lack of access to, to clean water. Um, and understand on the global front, if you don't have water, you can't even get to the hunger problem. Here in America, we, we have water, but we still have this hunger epidemic that's going on. Um, so it's, that's for me is, is where my heart is, uh, and where my passion is and really where I spend a lot of my time, you know, volunteering at different food banks and having different conversations and thinking about monetarily, you know, what I can do to, 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 to impact that particular, uh, that particular cause. And then on the, the, the sign on the STEM front, you know, being able to provide access to, to young, um, black and brown people to be exposed to science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, because as, as we know today, technology is really changing how we see the world and how we consume um, products and, and, and how we're protected from a privacy standpoint. And all those, uh, all these tech, technical, uh, technological issues um, were uh, developed or brought about or thought of by people um, who had these types of backgrounds, whether it was in science, that are solving these large and, 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 and complex uh, biological issues, whether it was technology with what's going on from a, a software standpoint and how we're changing things from a software and efficiency standpoint or engineering, how we're building the products that everybody is using these days and the math that's now being used and the art that's changing just how architecture is done all over the world and how we design things. Um, and for me, that's been a passion of trying to just expose young people to to those careers um, and to those opportunities and to those and to those 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 passions for them possibly uh, because those are the issues that are changing the world uh, you look at the stock market right now uh, technology is doing really really well and it's doing well for a reason because it's changing the way uh, humanity is 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 ran right now you got people who are going to the depths of the ocean going into space um, quantum computing changing how fast we can compute. Um, there's so many different things that that our young people should know about, but they just hear about on TV. And I want them to find. I want, and I've done things to find ways to get them exposed to those particular opportunities that are happening right now. And I've had great partners to do that with. So Chevron has been a great partner. I've worked with American Airlines down in Pittsburgh uh, when I was there. Um, have worked and done programs with Code.org, which is out of uh, out of uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, currently thinking about and working on a, pro- a pilot that's going to be done in New York. Um, you know, have spoken about this particular topic, have done a STEM camp um, in my hometown for the last three years, exposing my, my little small community to anything that science, technology, technology, engineering, and math related. Um, adopted the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy in Dallas, uh, where I'm able to, to, to drive home the same issues that I'm talking about right now from a STEM standpoint, and, and currently sit on two boards where I'm able to serve my alma mater um, as they're thinking about uh, diversity and, and finding ways to to increase the pipeline for for young people to get into uh, these particular fields. It's really good. Let's close it with this, and I, I just appreciate your heart and sharing all that. So thank you for doing that. But let's close it with this. 
Uh, let's get back to the, the Christian sort of spiritual side for a moment. And I'll just ask you, as you're getting ready for your seventh season, uh, you know, husband to Jessica, father to, Kal- is it Kalina? Kalina, yep. Kalina and Kelvin the third. I'm reading it off your Twitter bio, of course, <laughs> at Kelvin Beecham Jr. But where God has you right now, what's been your biggest spiritual battle? What are you, what are you struggling with spiritually or something that you wrestle with that you want to you wanna continue to kind of strive towards God for, for help on? You know, it's, it's two things. It's one, it's being intimate with Christ and being intimate with God. That's one of the things I'm struggling with because we get so busy in life where that's not the number one thing in our life. You know, um, we say, we say God, fam- well, I say God, family, and football, but am I spending, you know, hours upon hours with, with my heavenly father, which I need to be doing, you know? So that's number one. And then I think, you know, uh, again, it's flesh, you know, anything that this of flesh and, and that we give into flesh is, is sin. So the Bible talks about, we have to kill the flesh and the flesh has to die daily. We have to take up, pick up our cross and follow him. You know, that's, that's an act that we have to do every single day. Um, and for me, that's the, that's the, 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 the inner battle that has to happen um, personally um, that I'm always soliciting prayers for is that, that God kills that flesh, that old me um, that I know can rise up. Um, but I also know that can kill my marriage if, 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 if I allow it. Well, if I, if I go in the direction that I don't want it to go. So it's asking, you know, uh, my you know my confidants and people that are around me to to pray for me in that regard, and then me personally seeking God for uh, that flesh to die daily. I actually just came off a of fast and a shut in. Um, I actually fasted from Thursday of last week up until Sunday afternoon, and shut in the church Friday evening up until Sunday morning, um, praying for this very thing, is that God continue to to humble me and that. I continue to have the intimacy, uh, intimacy with Christ and that I kill flesh daily uh, because it's more than, you know, all right, you get caught up and you happen to be, you know, on ESPN and something happens. And I don't want to be on that ticket line for me is how can I dive into to, to, to Christ? How can I dive in more into my marriage and, and, and work on those things? Because those are the things that are most important. Football is great, but if I play football and lose my family and lose, um, you know, the the you know lose the, the the covenant that I have with Christ none of this none of this even matter you know so for me it's protecting um, and guarding the gift that God has given me and it's not the gift of playing football but it's the gift of life um, and the gift of grace and protecting that with everything that I got he is New York Jets offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham Jr. joining us here in the podcast Kelvin thanks so much man let's um, let's catch up in the middle of the season and see how things are going and, and maybe dive in more about how you're staying spiritually fed during the year but wish you nothing but the best and thanks for joining us here on the podcast yes sir anytime and we do thank Kelvin Beecham Jr. from the New York Jets for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast I gotta tell you just talking to him gets me fired up for the NFL season I, I love football and I'm so excited for the 2018 season and seeing how it plays out and of course really excited to see Kelvin uh, have an impact on and off the field this year we'll definitely get him back during the season and talk to him about what life is like uh, during the season and kind of what uh, the grind is like and certainly talk to him about his faith and you know what kind of Bible studies and time spent with the Lord him and his team have Uh, So we do appreciate Kelvin being here on the podcast. Again, you can follow him on Twitter at Kelvin Beecham Jr. Kelvin Beecham, B-A-C-H-U-M, and then Jr. is just J-R on Twitter. He's very active there, shares a lot of, uh, you know, impactful and encouraging posts on Twitter. So give him a follow over there. We thank him for joining us. We thank you for joining us. And of course, we thank Compassion International for being our sponsor. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. It's $38 a month. You can make a difference in a child's life by providing them food, clothing, education, giving them a hope, releasing them from poverty, all in the name of Jesus. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Thanks so much for joining us. As always, you can reach us on email. You can email me directly, Jason at Sports Spectrum. Dot com. You can also follow us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, like our YouTube channel where all of our content is found as far as video goes. And you can also go to sportspectrum.com. And that's where content 
from Sports Spectrum is posted every single day. We're talking about daily devotionals. We're talking about articles impacting the world of sports and faith, the intersection of sports and faith. So go to sportspectrum.com every day for new and updated content on the world of sports and faith. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.